Hey everybody, how's it going? Hi, I'm seeing some names that were here uh, with Chloe and I earlier this morning. Thanks for coming back. Let's give uh, let's give everybody just a few seconds to log in. Hello, hello. Holy cow, there's a lot of you here right now. <laughs> this is awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thanks again for coming back. Um, you guys are great. This is another broadcast of hashtag FFT Live put on by Fitter and Faster Swim Camps. My name's Tyler Clary. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Fitter and Faster. Um, this has been awesome doing these live webinars for you guys. Um, I've been super pumped at how many people are showing up. So uh, let me know in chat a couple of things, all right? I want to know, one, if you've been telling your friends about these webinars to sign up for them. And two, I wanna know where you're from and what swim team you're up in, all right? Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna just bring in our presenter. We're gonna do this a little bit differently today. Um, we've got Christopher Reed here with us, so he's gonna turn on his audio and video now. What's up, man? How are you, Christopher? Oh, you got to turn your video back on. Is it working now? Yep, we got you now. We got you. Oh, now it's off. Okay. There okay. it is. Okay. Now we're good. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> now Thanks we're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, doing doing all right, man. Obviously, you know, we chatted about this a little earlier, but you know, the the quarantine is getting a little bit old for me. Um, <laughs> It's uh, getting to a point where, you know, I'm getting pretty stir crazy and I want to get outside, but trying to avoid that as much as possible. How are you dealing with things? I'm doing all right. Uh, finally got myself into a workout schedule. So uh, doing a lot of dry land and durband running now. So kind of have my head around some things now. Good, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not doing so great about uh, working out. I've actually gained almost 10 pounds. So I got to get working on something a little bit different. <laughs> Chat, if, by the way, you guys may start to see my face getting a little more full as I gain weight, so that's going to be fun if you keep coming back to these things. Um, Christopher, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, oh, you still there? I think we lost him. Maybe it's his Wi-Fi. Um, guys, If uh, I I'm happy to keep chat on, um, but once you – finish telling us who you are and where you're from and that kind of stuff. Um, just go ahead and uh, chill out just a little bit so that we can get into the actual presentation and nobody gets distracted. By the way, if um, while we're figuring out Chris's uh, connection issues, um, you have two buttons that I want to talk to you about for just a second. There's a button like right over here. It's a red button with three dots on it. Um, if you're on your phone, I'm not entirely sure how that works yet, but you should see a red button with three dots. And if you click that button, it's actually going to move your chat screen off to the right. And then up at the top of the screen, you should see a button that says reconnect. And um, if you hit that button, if you have any connection issues or anything like that, it'll actually bring you back in and uh, we'll solve most of those connection issues. So. Now we've got Chris back. This is good. Um, where we left things, um, I had just asked you to talk a little bit about yourself and where you're from and give us a little bit of background on where you're, where you're uh, like a little bit of your swimming background. But before you do, um, guys, this is going to be roughly 45 to 55 minutes long. Um, and another warning on chat, please don't spam. If I see people spamming, I will ban you, okay? Um, we're here to, to learn about backstroke and I really don't want anything taking away from um, the, the presentation or from Christopher because he's graciously volunteering his time for us once again. So Christopher, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'm Christopher Reed. I am from South Africa originally. I'm from a small town in South Africa called Port Elizabeth. Um, it's on the south coast of South Africa but swam there my whole life, and I was very fortunate to get a, um, an opportunity to come to the United States to swim. Um, so I swam at the University of Alabama for four years. While I was there, I was a two-time SEC champ, All-American, and um, 
I was a swimmer at the Olympic Games. Um, uh, in 2016, I competed for South Africa. I uh, finished 10th in the 100 meter backstroke, and our relay got 13th in the 4x100 medley relay. And um, once I graduated, um, I felt called to leave Alabama, find something new. And um, now I'm at NC State, training off the Wolfpack, Wolfpack Elite. And uh, so that's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And, you know, just absolutely loving it. Um, new, new atmosphere, new environment, good people, good coaches, and really enjoying it. Um, I recently, um, before the whole Olympics got moved, I uh, qualified for Tokyo um, and was supposed to actually, what's today? Today's Monday. Today I would have actually swam my turner backstroke at my nationals and would have solidified my spot on the team. So a uh, bit of sweet about that. But um, yeah, I uh, studied finance and economics, um, statistical economics at Alabama. And now I'm just swimming full time and doing clinics with Fit and Foster. Cool, man. We're happy to have you. And, um, you know, I get the emails from uh, anytime, anytime somebody submits uh, a review of the weekend and you always get awesome reviews. So we're super stoked to have you. And uh, chat, by the way, this is not beer. This is Pellegrino water. So don't get any ideas. I'm drinking water. Um, so I guess let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that you might talk about in the very beginning of a backstroke clinic, like some of the very, very basics that everybody should keep in mind before we actually get into the presentation. Yeah, um, I think first off, backstroke's very different to every other stroke you're on your back, um, <laughs> which for a lot of people is very unnatural. Um, so I think the biggest thing before we try to get into any of the talk and techniques is just trying to be comfortable on your back. Um, you know, I see a lot of people go into survival mode where they, they're always looking around. They're always trying to grab a lane rope. Um, I think the key to swimming better backstroke is just being comfortable on your back and learning to float, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so true because, um, it's just like a weird, a weird situation, right? And, and backstrokers kind of like breaststrokers a little bit weird, right? We like to do everything upside down and backwards. So um, it's always kind of fun. But it, I, I feel like it's a good it's a good thing that you just talked about because it's a good lesson to learn. Like in swimming, you should never look where you want to go because if you're looking where you want to go, your head's out of position, right? And with backstroke, definitely, if you're looking where you want to go, something is very, very wrong. So if you can get used to just kind of having an awareness of where you are in the pool, that's going to help not only your backstroke, but pretty much all of your other strokes. So yeah. um, do you have anything else for us before we get right into the presentation? I'll just say trust. Uh, trust the water. The water's not going to let you go. You know, you're not going to sink to the bottom. Just trust it. Um, you know, just relax. And I think, I don't know, just the observation I've seen, all backstrokers are very relaxed, calm people. You know, maybe it goes with the stroke. <laughs> maybe. And now, there may be something to that, honestly. I don't know. But that's that's not a bad point, not one that I've thought about. Because most, yeah, I don't think I've ever met a backstroker that I would that I would call like a spaz. Like, <laughs> mo most backstrokers are pretty chill dudes. That's a good point. Yeah, but um, most backstrokers are just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Chat, shh, you didn't say that. Um, by the way, uh, let us know guys, uh, what your, what your favorite stroke is in chat. I'd love to hear what the numbers are or love to see what the, the number of people say backstroke is their best stroke. Or if we have a lot of people here that are not backstrokers cause, uh, they're, they're trying to learn backstroke. So let us know. Um, but let's get right into it. I'm going to pull up the presentation and, uh, make us a little bit bigger and let's get right into it. Go ahead, Chris. Tuffer. Yeah. Well, Kind of as we was talking about how backstroke is so important, you need to know how to float. Um, when, if anyone in the chat that, I mean, I want to see how many of you guys have actually been with me at a clinic and chat, but I always talk about trying to be a boat. We're trying to have a really big bow of the boat. Um, if any of you know history, what made the Dutch um, so good at what they did about traveling around the world is their boats. Their boats were very famous for having this really deep and 
wide boat, uh, bows of the boat. And they found that that would um, kind of help them float, go faster. And we're going to try to do that in our, our same with backstroke. So when I say to people, we try to get that same bow, if this is our normal shoulder position, we try to bring our shoulders forward and trying to make that same, uh, I don't know if you can use your, your mouse, Tyler, but to really show the emphasis of the, the wideness of the back, of the bow, we're trying to make our back um, Well, we we lost Christopher, but I, I think you guys can see this on the screen, and I'm kind of tracing the bow of the boat here with my bad mouse skills. But what he's talking about is having that kind of uh, that kind of V shape in the bottom of our uh, of our silhouette here. Julia Brzovsky, if you post stuff like that again, I will ban you. Okay, please don't do that. Um, let me turn whiteboard off here and hopefully we can get Chris back. Sometimes, guys, you can tell we're doing this live. Sometimes you have technical issues and we just got to get through it. But, you know, what he's talking about is having, um, you know, in, in freestyle, you usually you try to have a pretty aligned, uh, aligned shoulder position. And a lot of swimmers in backstroke tend to swim with a bit of a, you know, pulled forward shoulder position right here like this. So you're getting a little bit of that bow shape in the front of the boat that Chris was talking about. Um, and you do that by not just, you know, trying to slouch back backwards. You know, if you just slouch backwards, that's going to cause your back to drop and you don't want that. It's actually pulling the shoulders forward just a little bit. Okay. So also you want to make sure that your body has a flat line relative to the surface of the water. So if you can tell in this, uh, this graphic on the bottom right hand, you want to have your body, again, your hips, your knees, and your ankles should be pretty close to parallel to the surface of the water. And there might be a little bit of a downward tilt, maybe just a little bit, but not that much at all. Um, also, your head position should be back. That doesn't mean that you're looking backwards like this because that's going to completely break your backstroke, your body position down. Okay, you also don't want to be staring at your feet either. So for those of you who were a part of our, um, let us let me know, chat, by the way, if you were a part of the uh, the search or excuse me, the uh, the video stroke analysis that I did with Amy on Friday. And the reason I'm asking is because, all right, Indiana Abram, do that again and I will ban you. OK, don't do that, please. So I was using this hairspray bottle last week. So if you pick your head up and you're swimming with your head looking back like you're looking towards the flags, that's going to drop your head down and cause your hips to pop up and you'll be plowing through the water like this. Think of your body as a torpedo for a second. So if you're trying to push this torpedo through the water as fast as you possibly can, you want that torpedo to move through the water in this orientation. If your head is looking back like you're looking straight up, that's going to make basically your body position like this, and you're going to be plowing that torpedo through the water this way. On the opposite side, on the opposite side of that, if you're looking down at your toes like this, it's going to cause your hips to sink. So if this is your head, your head will go up like you're looking towards your toes, and that's going to cause your hips to sink, and then your torpedo will be plowing through the water like this. So always in backstroke and really in any stroke, whenever you're trying to move through the water, I have hairspray, Tiffany, because I share a bathroom with my fiance. You're always trying to move that torpedo through the water with the smallest amount of, uh, of surface area pushing back on you. So imagine the torpedoes moving through the water like this. In an ideal world, you can just see the very top, the very tip top of that torpedo. Okay, all right, Pepe, Jeff, you're getting banned. All right, that's that, okay? When you pick your head up, that effectively causes the torpedo to go like this, and now you can see this whole bottom surface of the, of the bottle, and it's like you're pushing the, the water bottle through the water like this. If you're looking straight up, it causes the exact opposite to happen, and you're trying to push through the water like this, okay? Does everybody understand that? Let me know in chat if you understand that while we're trying to figure out what's going on with Chris here. It crashed for him. 
Keep. Hold on a sec. I'm texting him right now. Um, let's see here. So let's let's move on for a second. Uh, let's you know. So we're talking again about head position. There he is. He's back. Hey, good sorry. to have you back, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, so I kind of went through a lot of these points, and I I used my uh, my trusty hairspray bottle that my fiance has so graciously lent to me to talk about body position, and how the head you know sort of affects the body as it moves through the water, right? So talk us through some of the, the points you were trying to make before you disconnected. Um, okay, well, I don't even know when I cut off. <laughs> um, but, I mean, pretty much when I, whenever I do backstroke, I'm always thinking about having my head still just very much like that diagram by keeping that same fo uh, shape forward. So when I tell people, is, chat, I want you guys to all take your hands like this, turn it down, and put it on your thighs and bring your shoulders forward. So when you want to swim backstroke, you want to rotate your whole body except your head, right? And just kind of how Tyler was talking about how if this is your body, you don't want to be your head underwater and your feet up or your feet down and sagging. You kind of want to have that same boat-like shape. I don't know if that's something I uh, repeated of you, Tyler. No, it, it, you did. Uh, you did repeat it, but that's such a good point to repeat. Um, real quick, I'm gonna disable chat right now because people are taking advantage of it, guys. Anytime I catch spammers like this that can't get the message, I'm just gonna disable chat. So we're gonna go ahead and do that right now. All right. So chat has been disabled. Chris, please continue. Yeah, um, and I think um, you know we can talk about having that boat shape and really focusing on floating, but at the end of the day, if we go on to that next slide, it's really the head position. Um, I don't know about for you and your backstroke, but for me, I'm always focusing about what my head is doing. You know, because sometimes I'd be swimming with a snake, my head would be moving. So I'm always trying to focus on having that head position. So kind of there on the left or on the right, um, I think this is a pretty obvious demonstration of the three different head positions a lot of people have. The top one, being obviously what we would want, keeping a whole body down uh, or horizontal and flat on the water. But as soon as we start lifting our head, right, our whole body is going to start curling and our feet are going to drag. So, it, for instance, like if we're in a race and we push off the wall in a streamline and we pop up and we tilt our head down and look to the scoreboard, what's that going to do? It's most likely going to slow us down, right, Tyler? Correct. Right? Absolutely correct. Uh, now, I'm not going to say I've never looked at the scoreboard. I've looked at the scoreboard many times <laughs> when I was um, racing, but I try not to now. Obviously, if we have our head back like that, I mean, how many of us, when we were swimming into the wall, have looked back, thrown our whole head backwards to see how far we are from the wall, right? I've done that. I remember doing that when I was growing up. Um, First off, as you can see on the very bottom picture, that slows you down. All the water is just going to be hitting you on the forehead, okay? So kind of the, the picture on the left is a very good, um, If I would say that's a pretty good demonstration of just head control and ability. I don't know if you've ever done this, Tyler, but um, when I was growing up, my coach would get us all little coffee cups and... Um, He'd make us go across the pool. Even one day, one of our swimmers, he was like, okay, I'm putting my hot cup, of, hot cup of coffee on your head, and you need to make it all the way through the other side of the pool. Right? Yeah, I used to do that drill quite a lot, but we didn't we didn't have hot coffee in there because that, that would be a lot of coffee because I was on a pretty big team. But we used to do that drill quite often because it teaches, just like you're talking about, it teaches having perfect head control because in swimming – Really, I'd say in backstroke more than every other stroke, you keep your head more still. And being able to train that by keeping that that cup there is such a is such a useful thing because you know, not just, you know, we were talking about how head position, if your head is high, your hips are low, and if your head is low, your hips are high. The exact same thing is true if you move your head left and right. 
So if you're a swim, you're, if you're a backstroker that kind of wobbles your head left and right, your hips again do the exact opposite. So if you wobble your head to the left, your hips are going to pop out right, and that's actually going to cause you to kind of uh, snake through the water. Not like dolphin kick. We actually want that to be the case, but that causes you to actually kind of like fishtail through the water. And and if you were to swim, let's say a 25 yard lap, you know, if your pool is 25 yards but you're moving your head to the side like this, you're actually gonna swim a longer distance than 25 yards. You could swim like 26 yards and be making your job even harder and giving it, you know, basically giving everybody else an advantage. So that's that's a really, really great drill and, and she is demonstrating it quite well. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I mean, I think us another uh, mistake some of us make is when we're doing our backstroke stroke, we will follow and watch our hand by turning our head and watching our hand enter and pulling down. So same thing, it's kind of, we're doing, we're actually doing two things. We're nodding our head up and down, but then also we're doing that snaky snake. So, you know, I think for a lot of us, if what I, I, I think a common draw that I will do when I'm racing is if I'm in an indoor pool, I'll pick a beam in, of the roof and I'll follow that beam and I'll just let, I'll try and have my nose, um, you know, pointing to that beam the whole time. I don't want to go past it. And even if I'm racing outdoors um, in warm up, I'll make sure to pick a cloud. I, I, let's say I'm in lane one or two. Uh, I'll go into lane one and two, warm up in that, in that lane and pick a cloud and make sure that I'm following that cloud with my nose. And my, if my head, my nose is pointing out to the other side of the cloud, then I know I'm probably going to be swimming into the lane or pretty soon. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. Cause you know, I, um, couple, couple of stories. Well, one, I grew up in Southern California, so I started swimming outdoors and I've kind of always been pretty, um, proficient at swimming backstroke. So I just kind of had to figure out how to keep my reference. But one thing, probably the biggest thing for me that was helpful in making sure I was swimming straight down the middle of the lane, instead of bouncing off the lane lines, like, you know, like bowling with the bumpers, would be, um, you know, just having different goggles. So some goggles have better peripheral vision than others, right? Right. Like some goggles you wear, it's basically like you're just looking through two tubes and you can only kind of see what's straight in front of you. But with other goggles, you can see kind of everything around you. So I wear the old school, like the Swedish goggles that are basically just two pieces of plastic that are um, relatively clear all the way around. But by doing that, I can see, you know, almost a full 180 degrees in either direction. So I can be I can be laying flat on my back and be able to see out of either side of my field of view how far I am away from the lane line and not only keep myself in the center of the of the lane if necessary, or if I'm trying to draft off of somebody, I can move over to one side of the lane and be able to tell with a pretty good level of, of accuracy how close I am to that lane line. So I'm close enough to draft, but not too close to hit the lane line, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, your comment earlier about looking at the scoreboard makes me think about the, uh, the Olympic trials venue in Omaha. Have you, have you been there or, or seen it? No, I've only seen pictures of it. So it's it's basically they put a pool right in the middle of of an arena that's like designed for like basketball games and hockey games. So it's like it's a really nice arena, wow. but it's got this gigantic Megatron like screen thing in the middle. So it's got, you know, four TV screen or I think it's actually eight TV screens um, and they have one on each side that's for, you know, displaying the race. And then they have ads and stuff. But during the race, while you're swimming backstroke, you can actually watch the live video of the races that's going on and kind of look around and see what's happening. But it's um, it's both a good and a bad thing. And you have to kind of teach yourself to not get distracted by that stuff. So for the people in chat that are watching right now, um, if you are fine, you have issues with staying in the middle of the lane line and staying straight, um, you know, definitely try out some of the things that um, that Christopher was talking about with like finding a beam on the top of the the top of the like the ceiling of the building that you're swimming in or trying to look at a cloud. But if you find those things aren't working for you, maybe try different goggles that have better peripheral vision so you can see straight out to the either side, like the Swedish goggles, for example. And you may find that it's easier for you to keep a reference on where you are in the center of the lane. 
Yeah, no, so, um, yeah, do you have anything else to, to say about head position? No, I mean, that's it for me. Okay, we'll move on. All right, lower body and kick. What do you have for us, Christopher? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that that first diagram where we have those three people standing there, um, we, okay, first off, I just want to, show the difference is the one the very the one on the very far left um you see his pelvis is kind of tilted kind of like his pelvis is pointing through his head the other one is just kind of a neutral spine where it's just kind of straight and then the third one is kind of like what i say to people donald duck but right it's you, you're curling your back and um in backstroke i think for a tendency for a lot of us is when we're lying on our back i'm i'm six foot six the, the the longest part about me is my legs. My legs are very heavy. That's where a lot of my weight is. So I need to have a really strong core to kind of curl my legs up so I'm not sinking the whole time, right? I need to try and get my legs up. So the way I kind of attain that or achieve that is with my hips. I kind of curl my hips in a way for chat. If any of you guys are sitting at home, it's kind of like have you ever done a, um, a crunch or a sit-up? That same feeling you get with your stomach when you do a crunch and you're holding that crunch is the same feeling I try to get in my backstroke is to try and bring my hips up, to bring my legs up. Um, because I think from that illustration of the boat, when we're on the one on the very far right, when our back is having that Donald Duck back, our legs are now automatically sinking down to the floor. And when our legs are pointing down to the floor and we start kicking, we're going to be like that boat, um, that, that first boat, where kind of the whole boat's out of the water. We're not really going to be going just directly straight. We're going to, all our energy is going to be going up and forward. So kind of bringing our feet up by curling and bringing our spine up and getting that nice boat shape, when we start kicking, we have that direct movement horizontally or flat, if that makes sense, Tyler. No, that makes complete sense. And, um, you know, th there's a pretty famous swimmer that I'm sure you've heard of. And, Chad, I'm sure you guys have heard of this person, too, a um, guy named Ryan Lochte. And he, he always used to talk to me about, you know, that backstroke was like one of the most painful strokes out there. And I'm sure some people will agree or disagree. Um, with that. But what he always talked about was like, it, it feels like you're, you know, you're running, you know, a, a sprint race while doing a sit up and having somebody punch you in the gut the whole time. And I think that's, that's basically his way of talking about the, the sort of the pelvic tilt that you want and the core activation that you want to keep your, your legs up high. And again, this gets back to that water bottle thing. If your legs are dragging behind you, you're effectively just plowing through the water like this way. But if you're able to activate your core and tilt your pelvis just a little bit, kind of like tuck your butt in, it'll get your, your legs closer up to the surface of the water so you can pierce through the water instead of plowing through it. So that's super, super, super important. And you can have the best, the best stroke in the world you could have the best aerobic capacity in the world. Um, you could be the strongest in your upper body in the world. But if you don't have that core connection and the ability to keep your, your feet up towards the surface, you're just never going to swim faster than somebody who's able to do that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. Um, I, I pulled everybody that's watching and asked, do you keep your legs near the water surface in backstroke? And 86% said yes and 13% said no. So... For those 13% of people, do you have an idea on, you know, one or two things that they might be able to think about or work on to try and get their legs up closer to the surface? Yeah, well, um, chat, I think while you guys are all at home, I want you to go sit if you're in your room or your living room, lie down on the ground, okay? And what I want you to try to do is you can either try going a streamline or you can have your hands on your thighs. And what I want you to try to do is have a flat back and lift your legs off the ground so kind of like have any of us ever done when we lift our legs and we do the scissors kicks those are very good for the core but let's try to get into that streamlined position while we're lying flat on the ground 
I want you to try to lift your feet off the ground without moving your, your body or your hands by this much. And if you can hold your legs and your feet above the ground without letting your feet touch the ground for what I'd say probably 30 seconds or a minute, that's a very good idea of where you are for your, I mean, your, your core, getting your core nice and strong. Um, that's, I mean, uh, I'd even say planking. So when we're getting down on our, our elbows and planking, that's working the same thing. But I think if you want to get your core, if you want get, to get your stomach, your core strong enough to lift your legs, I'd say lie on your back in a streamlined position, doing either those flutter kicks or just doing V-ups. Um, and that's super important. And the only point that I want to make is, is that if you do that drill, you should definitely pay attention to how much of your lower back is touching the ground. So let's imagine for a second that this is your lower back. Naturally, and here, I'll do it this way so it kind of matches the, the skeleton in the middle there. So naturally, your back has a little bit of an arch like this. If you're going to do that, that ab exercise with your hands up, up in streamlined position and your feet out you know, during scissor kicks, you want to try to pull your lower back by really engaging your abs and tilting your pelvis the other way so that it causes the whole of your lower back to touch the ground. So effectively, you should be able to lay there and take one hand and slide it behind your lower, and try to slide it behind your lower back. And if you're doing a good job, you won't be able to get that hand in between your lower back and the ground. If you can do that and hold that and do scissor kicks for like 30 seconds to a minute, that's really, really, really gonna help your body position overall. So let's talk a little bit about the kick, um, not necessarily the underwater dolphin kick, but um, you know, what do you think about for your flutter kick and backstroke and how important is it? Yeah. So kind of we've been talking about boats. We've been trying to have a, a boat shape with our back, and we're trying to get a better line. I think with the picture, it's, it, it kind of answers the same thing, as we want to kind of have a little motorboat engine, um, having these very small but fast kicks. I've watched some of a lot of my competitors that would have these really big, powerful kicks. And I even used to swim backstroke where I was having these really big, wide kicks, and I felt strong. But I wasn't going very fast because when the water would come, it would just slow me down. So when I say to people, I want our backstroke kicks so kind of sound like a drum. Where it's, right? I don't know if you could you hear that? That little drum beat, right? It's yes. kind of having the Because I think for a lot of people when we swim backstroke, we are so concerned about trying to stay afloat and trying to use our arms. Our feet kind of just go one kick there. One kick there, one kick there. And then we try and make our arms go faster and we ended up just going the same speed. Mm -hmm. So I think the one thing, in at least in my backstroke experience, is trying to have a very small but fast kick, kind of sounding like a drum beat. And if we want to make our arms go faster, we need to kick faster. I think um, in all the other strokes, I'm not – as confident in saying this, but for backstroke, a lot of people try and get their arm rate up quicker by just moving their arms, but their legs don't change. So if you can get your kick tempo faster, your arms are just going to fall into that that tempo and naturally go faster, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. No, that makes complete sense, and that's a great way to think about it. And, and in general, I think that most strokes are kick-driven strokes. So if you start thinking about every one of your strokes as as being kick first, pull second, that's going to help you in general not only get faster, but learn how to up your tempo. Because if you up your kick, you know, that's like the base of your engine, that's going to allow the rest of the engine, your arms to, to keep up with it, right? Um, have you ever played badminton before? No, I have not. Well, but do you know what that like weird little thing is with like the feathers coming out the back? What's that thing called? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're going about. <laughs> okay, so anybody that's in chat later on when we re-enable chat, you guys can let me know what that thing is called. But that's something that I want you to think of. It's it's basically a ball that's got like a shuttle. A what? A shuttle. I think it's called a shuttle. A shuttle? Like a long yeah, that, shuttle. That, 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds close, right? But it's got basically a bunch of feathers that come out like this. So if you have a really wide kick, you're essentially a birdie. It's called a birdie. My bad. Essentially, yeah, I, I thought it was called a shuttle something too. Um, so if you think about it, the way that birdie is made is actually made to fly through the air very slowly, right? As soon as you hit it, instead of that thing rocketing to the other side of the of the the field or arena, whatever it's called, it actually it slows itself down really quickly to give the person on the opposite side of the net the opportunity to hit it, right? Yeah. And if you have a really large kick, you're effectively turning your body into a birdie that slows itself down really efficiently. But if you have here, let me put the, the cap on this bottle because that's going to allow me to demonstrate a little bit. Let's let's imagine for a second that this is our, our body again. If you're just kicking within the frame of your body, nice and narrow, kind of like Christopher was saying, it's going to allow the water to flow past your body much more easily while still giving you the ability to kick. But as soon as you start opening up really wide and getting outside of the frame of that body, you're turning yourself into that birdie again. So you, you want to avoid that, again, by keeping yourself within that narrow circle. One of the things that I talk about at the clinics is, you know, imagining that you're always trying to fit your body within a six-inch PVC pipe. So let's say that that's maybe this big. So you want to kick within that PVC pipe. Anytime you kick outside of that PVC pipe, it's really going to slow yourself down. And I, I think that kind of visual would maybe help people understand why it's important to kick kind of narrowly. Yeah, um, no, good point. Do you have anything else for us before we move on to the next slide? No, that's good for me. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of our uh, some of our favorite drills. And interestingly enough, um, there are a lot of the same drills here that I use. And that's kind of an interesting point. Um, and this isn't just for swimmers and coaches, but a lot of times when people show up to clinics, at least for me, you know, everybody's sort of like, waiting for me to give some magical drill or some magical tip that's going to happen to um, make their backstroke just way better all of a sudden. Or coaches, for example, can sometimes have a little bit of, um, they might be hesitant towards having us in for a clinic because they think that we're going to teach something that's way different from what they already teach. And I'm sure you've experienced this already, but I've had multiple coaches come up to me and say, oh, well, I, I thought you were going to teach something different, but really you teach all the same things that we're already teaching. And if anything, we validate what the coaches are already saying, right? And I think the point is, is that the best swimmers in the world don't necessarily do any drills that are any different from the ones that we've already heard of before. We just do them better. We focus on the details, right? So I'm sure that the people in chat have seen a lot of these drills before, but the way that we might talk about them would be a little bit different. So talk to us a little bit about your drills and why you why you chose to put them on screen. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I was reading uh, with everything that happened with Kobe, some people came out with a lot of um, some of Kobe's uh, training. And one thing this reporter was talking about is how when he watched Kobe train, Kobe would do the most basic drills that people would be doing in high school. And he did it again and again and again. And this guy that was watching was expecting Kobe to do like these crazy, like under the legs, jumps, whatever. And he went up to Kobe afterwards and uh, was like, hey, you know, was that your practice? It was just high school drills. Um, they're basic. And he's like, yeah, that is exactly right. They're basic. Is while everyone else is trying to master this, that, and that, and all these different things. I've mastered the basics and I'm way better than them in, in the basics, you know? And, yeah. Um, the best honestly, do the basics better. Yeah. And honestly, it's, I always say to people, if you watch the 50 freestyle at the Olympic games, um, the easiest thing that all of those guys can do is train, train hard. All of them know how to train hard. It's, the guy that's mastered and did the basic starts entering, entering through that one hole when he enters in, it's, it's maybe um, the basic of a 53 is not taking a break. Maybe, you know, and all those guys come to the wall and separated by 0.50 of a second, you know, and it's, it's basics. Um, right. But one thing before we go into those drills, someone asked, Natalie asked me, you know, she's, she's um, how does she improve her breathing? 
for backstroke. You know, it's very difficult for her. And I think that's a very good point. That is something we need to talk about is our breathing. Um, you know, I think like with freestyle, a lot of people breathe every four for a hundred. Um, for, for, for a Turner freestyle, they breathe every two. For backstroke, I kind of do the same thing in the sense of for 100 meter backstroke, I'm breathing probably every four strokes. So I take a breath on my every fourth stroke on my right arm. So I'll be one, two, three, and then the, the fourth one, I'll take that breath, one, two, three, four. I'll be holding my breath for every four just because I'm trying to get more power. But for Turner backstroke, um, I'm breathing every stroke. So I'll be, and Same. while I'm pulling, I'll breathe out. And once I get this arm in, pull down. But it's getting into rhythm. Um, you know, I, I some of my friends who train for the 400 IM, some of them breathe every three. So they'll take the breath, one, two, oh, wait, <laughs> breath, one, two, three, breathe, and doing the same thing. I think um, the most, I can't, I'm not a master at the 400 IM or the, the 200, um, but I think the biggest thing with your breathing is finding a rhythm. You know, because some people, when they just swim backstroke, they start hyperventilating, so they're just breathing whenever. <sighs> it it um it doesn't work. It uses more energy. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Tyler. So I'm probably a bad example <laughs> because <laughs> I actually breathed every stroke, like every arm hit, not even every stroke. So I would um I would I would actually hyperventilate. So I would breathe breathe, 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 you know, and, and I would be kind of taking shallow breaths and that seemed to work for me. But I think the, the point is, and, and I'm, I don't, I'm not saying I do it right. And I'm not, th I don't think you're saying you do it right either. And I think the point is for everybody watching is that they should really be figuring out kind of works, what works for them. I would say if you get to the end of your race, um, let's say at a 200 backstroke, even a hundred backstroke for some of you younger swimmers, um, and you notice that, you know, your, your chest is getting super tight and you notice that you're breathing on every arm hit, then maybe try adding a delay in between it. So only breathe when your right hand enter the, enters the water or when your left hand enters the water and exhale on the opposite side. Maybe that would be something to figure out. Um, or if you notice that you're getting into your breaststroke in the 400 IM, if you're one of those unfortunate souls like me that had to swim the 400 IM all the time, um, and you notice that you're super out of breath and maybe it's attributed to uh, really kind of over breathing in your backstroke. I think we've lost Chris again. So, you know, let's talk. Uh, um, oh, he's back. back. Okay. So uh, we, I was just still talking about breathing. So um, we'll open up the chat at the very end y'all so that you can ask us some direct questions about backstroke and we'll try to answer a handful of them to the best of our ability, but like talk us through body position kick. Yeah. So, um, same thing. Chat chat kind of said to all of us, we take our hands, put them directly on our thighs. And all we're doing is going to be bringing our shoulders forward, not up, but forward. And we're trying to create that, that round of our back so we can float. And all I do is I'll do 25s where I'll swim normal or I'll swim how I would be freestyle with my shoulders back. And I'll just feel the resistance of the water kind of weighing me down. And what I do is I bring my shoulders forward and kind of create that same, uh, that float. And what I'll do is I'll just do a length. I'll try and feel the water by bringing my shoulders back and forth. Then I'll start bringing my kick so I'll have my shoulders forward, keeping that head and that nose straight, and I'll just be rotating. So I'll generally do like six kicks, and I'll try to be controlled. Six kicks, rotate. Six kicks, rotate. Just trying to learn um, for my body to, to float. I do it in every new pool I go into, just try and get used to that water. Um, I have the 2-2 two -two drill, where it's just a single arm drill, so I'll be have the one arm down by my side, and I'll do two single arm strokes. It'll be one, two. But what I'm really trying to work on is getting even rotation. So my very first stroke is going to be somewhat deep. My second stroke is going to be deeper. And then when I rotate, I'm going to try and hit the same depth on each side. So it's kind of teaching me to swim backstroke as a ro I'm someone that rotates my backstroke to rotate evenly 
on both sides because I've seen a lot of swimmers where they go backstroke where their hand where their body just kind of dips into one side. So it's asymmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to have symmetry there. Um, then we have the coffee backstroke drill. So you know, I do it with my Gatorade bottle. It's a lot harder, um, but I'd, I'd say get maybe a Gatorade cup or Powerade cup. Just stick that here on your forehead. Um, but you, you don't want ball. it up here on your unicorn horn. You want it right here on the center of your forehead because if you put it here, that's going to lend itself to bad body position. But if you put it on your forehead, and this is a super important detail, if you put it right here on your forehead just above your goggles, that's going to force you into a good head position. You don't want it up here on, on the top of your head because that's going to cause you to look at your feet, and we've already talked about it uh, a bunch, how that causes your hips to drop. Yeah. Um, so with coffee cup backstroke, I just swim slow. So I'll just take my time, get that same position, and swim really slow. And then once I get comfortable and my head's still, then I'll start going a little faster. And I'll try to go a little faster. And um, I've never done a race with a coffee cup on my head, but I'd say – I could probably do a 50 backstroke with a, a cup on my head, probably going about 32, 33 seconds of length with not having the cup falling off. So that's a goal that's for impressive. you. That, um, to try to have that same, same still head position from going really slow and then building it up. And then um, the overkick backstroke with slow arms. So this is trying to get the tempo. So we're going to start in a streamline having very small but fast kicks, and then we're going to slowly bring in our arms, still maintaining that fast kick, and then we're going to try make our arms go faster and faster and faster, trying to get into rhythm with the, the kick. What, chat, what you'll most likely find and see is when you do the overkick backstroke drill, it's really going to hit your core. It's going to be really tough because you're going to really have to tighten up your core to be able to kick and then have your arms going slower. Um, so what I'll do for 50 backstroke in, uh, at a pool is I'll start off in a streamline, starting really slow, then I'll build up my kick, get a really small, fast kick, and then I'll bring my arms really slow, and then I'll start getting the arms in faster and faster and faster until I'm reaching my max speed for my legs and my arms. Do you have any other drills, Tyler? No, um, and that's that's a great drill and, and something I didn't start doing until the very end of my career. But um, the only other drill that I want to add to this is um, some people know it as elementary backstroke. Um, you know, you probably know it as double arm backstroke. And a lot of times it's used as more of like a recovery drill or stroke than anything. But before we get into it, I want to talk about like the way we pull on the water and and talk about why it's important to think about you know not just pulling with our hands so a lot of people in swimming think that they just that they're only pulling with their hands in the water um but really you're actually pulling with the whole surface from your elbows to your fingertips and actually amy talked about this on on friday but in backstroke you're actually trying to pull with this whole surface right here so if you think about it if i'm trying to go this way I always want to be pushing in the, in the exact opposite direction. If I'm trying to be as efficient as possible with my energy, I always want to push in the exact opposite direction than I want to go. So if we think about that, you're able to pull more on the water with more surface area. So if I'm just pulling with my hand, I have that much surface area. But if I'm pulling with my whole rest of my arm now i've based i've almost quadrupled the amount of surface area that i'm able to pull with so in backstroke what we're trying to do is get on the water as high above our head as possible to keep our our hand pointed this way if i'm trying to go this way and then as as um, the stroke progresses i get to about here and now this whole surface is vertical and i'm able to pull directly backwards so think instead of trying to pull your hands backwards, that you're trying to set your hand at a good anchor point, and then you're trying to move your body past that anchor point, if that makes any sense at all. So what I used to do to work on this was double arm backstroke, where what I would do is, is enter with my hands up way up, up above my head, get my hands on the water, and then point them down towards my toes as best as I could, and then try to anchor on the water and move my body past those anchors. And then also, 
that drill, um, I, I use a lot of different things in certain drills to kind of think and feel them out. But in, in backstroke, what I see a lot of younger backstrokers that can get faster doing that they need to be doing better is pulling with what I call a constant speed hand pull. So constant speed means that your speed isn't changing. It's always the same. And that looks kind of like this. So their, their hand speed, even though the direction of their hand is changing, the speed is never changing. So one of the drills that I do that's a, just a little bit like elementary backstroke or double arm backstroke that's a little different is I would do two pulls at a constant hand speed. So where I was going, you know, just constant like this. And then I would do two pulls where I accelerate my hands towards my feet. And the idea is, is that if you're accelerating from here to here in your pull path and really throwing that water towards your feet as you move past those anchors, you're gonna be able to transmit more power into the water. So I would do a lap, for example, of double arm backstroke, really just feeling that nice high elbow connection and then moving past my anchors with my body. And then I would do another lap where I was doing two constant speed hand pulls and then two accelerating hand pulls. And I would just feel what the difference was. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but in my, well, I am about to say that, I guess. But in my experience with the acceleration that gives you more power and it doesn't really take a lot more energy. Does that make sense, Chris, Tuffer? Yeah. It it's the second sense. time I've caught myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess uh, before we open up chat here, I, I want to talk about, you know, some some training stuff. So in backstroke, one of the things I like to do was try to do freestyle sets, but backstroke and see how many of the freestylers that I could keep up with while I was doing backstroke. And I found that, um, you know, I'm more of a long distance backstroker. I was much better at the 200 than 100. So this definitely doesn't apply to everybody. But it was definitely common for me to do like a test set of 10 300s backstroke and just try to keep up with people as best I could. And one of the things that I could tell, um, you know, you kind of talked about this with the, you know, the, the shrugging of the shoulders a little bit earlier. One of the things that I could tell um, that was like it was my indicator that I was rotating enough was whether or not my shoulders started to bleed right here. So I am blessed and cursed with really thick, coarse facial hair. You don't see it right now because I shaved this morning, but it's really, really rough right here. And on every stroke, what I tried to do is get my shoulder right up next to my head. And then as my hand got to vertical, I would rotate that shoulder past my head to drop it into the water. And that allowed my hand to place right in the perfect spot every time. And because I have really coarse facial hair, it would actually rub the skin off on either side of my shoulders and I would start to bleed a little bit. But, so 10 300s backstroke was something I used to do all the time and it was awesome and terrible at the same time. What is like, um, what is, what's the hardest backstroke set you've ever done? Hardest backstroke set I've ever done? Um, it was probably when I was at Alabama, uh, myself and Connor Osman, we did 50 50s short course yards on 30 second interval. Ooh. Uh, yeah, if and that was when I wasn't good at underwater kicking. And if I didn't kick out at least 10 yards of each wall, I didn't make the interval. <laughs> Oof. Yeah, yeah, that sounds terrible. It sounds like some uh, some lactate tolerance for sure. I'm sure you were burning like eight, eight or nine into those things. You were like, oh, am I going to get to the end of the 50 of them, right? 50 of them, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. Mm -mm. No, thanks. Um <laughs> But yeah, let's uh, let's open up chat. So chat, I'm, I'm going to uh, enable the chat function again. Um, so let us know if you have any questions for us specifically about backstroke. Um, and, you know, we'll try to answer a couple of them and see, you know, if, if we can help anybody out. Uh, ah, uh, shuttlecock, that's what it's called. It's, it's the shuttlecock. I knew it had something to do with shuttle. So <laughs> let's see, questions. I bounce a lot with backstroke. What am I doing wrong? Okay, so this is a great, great question. So we talked about this earlier. So for uh, in physics, for every force, there's an equal and opposing force. So if I'm trying to move this way, I want to push this way. So if I notice that somebody's bouncing, which means that there's their, their head is going up, that means at some point in their stroke, they're pushing down. Does that make sense? 
Bella Delgado, you're getting banned. Um, so in the beginning of the poll, a lot of times I'll notice people will actually pull downwards or push downwards before they start to pull backwards. Or at the very end of their poll, they'll, they'll finish and then push down at the very end. That downward push is actually what's causing that bounce. So if uh, one of the drills that I like to do is uh, I use the, the lane line actually to, I pull on the lane line to, to, to use it as a drill, but I do it in a very specific way. So obviously the lane, the lane line has that lane rope in the middle and then it's got all those plastic buoys around it. If you grab onto those plastic buoys, my goal was always to try to push the plastic buoys straight down the lane rope so that you couldn't tell that I was pulling on the lane line at all. And that really helps you focus on that backwards push that you want. And it, a lot of times it gets rid of the, uh, the up, and, up and down bounce. What about you, Christopher? Do you have any, any ideas on how to stop the bounce in backstroke? Um, I'd really just say for me, it's pulling on the side. So um, again, a lot of us, as Tyler was saying, our hands going down, I just try sweep my hand out further so if this is how i'm usually swimming backstroke i'm going to try and swim my hand out further just trying to maintain myself close and low to the the water surface um, okay i saw a question someone asked about do i breathe through my now my mouth or through my nose and backstroke and i think just like last week you were talking about a nose clip so chat, some of us use nose clips when we swim backstroke just because we need a kick underwater. So some people just don't like the nose. So I don't personally race with the nose clips. I'm breathing out of my nose and my mouth at the same time. Um, but uh, Tyler races with a nose clip and he breathes just out of his mouth, right? Yep. Um, so some people will breathe in through their mouth and out through their nose if they don't use a if you don't use a nose clip. But I started training with a nose clip and that really helped me because I'm not one of those weirdos that can flip my lip up over my nose like like this or whatever. And that really helped me keep the buoyancy in my chest so I could get back up to the surface on my underwaters a little bit better. Um, and obviously, if you've got a nose clip on, you can't breathe in or out your nose. So you just learn to breathe in and out your mouth and you time that with the splashing uh, that happens. Uh, here's a good question. How do you overcome the fear of the wall? Trinity, uh, Trinity Anderson asked that question. So the first thing to realize is that the wall's not moving, right? The only thing that's moving is you. So if you know that the wall is not just going to jump out and bite you, the thing that I would say is, is get really used to learning what your, um, what your stroke count is into the wall. Once you learn your stroke count, you're going to hit it every single time. I mean, I can't think of that. Actually, I do have one funny story. So there used to be this swim meet down at SMU, um, which is in which is in uh, Texas. And it was at an old pool that the that has been condemned since then. And it was really dark. And I forgot to bring my outdoor goggles. So I would have a set of indoor goggles and a set of outdoor goggles that um, either allowed me to filter out some of the sun if I was outdoors or if they, if it was, uh, you know, if I had my clear goggles on, it was better for being indoors. Well, I only brought my outdoor goggles and this pool happened to be really dark. So I, you know, do my start, do my kick out, go to 15 meters and I start swimming and, you know, I'm swimming. I was like, man, I feel like I've been swimming for a while and I haven't seen the flags. And the next thing I know, I ran straight into the wall. I actually cut open the top of my head. And there used to be video of this. I actually knocked myself out for a couple of for a couple of seconds. Michael Phillips, you're being banned. Um, so sometimes that happens, but oftentimes it's not because you know there's there's something going wrong. I just couldn't see the flags, right? So. I would say learn your stroke count into the wall and you'll be able to figure that part out and you won't be as as uh, as afraid of the of the wall. So we've got one more we've got time for one more question. One more question. Uh, can you re-explain uh Chris, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um I think maybe you you minimized your uh, your your tab or something. Somebody wanted you to re-explain the two-two drill. Yeah. Um, so, can you see me now? No. 
That's that's all good. Um, all while you're figuring that part out, I'll find another. How do you maintain backstroke tempo? So um, there are these really really cool um, devices called tempo trainers. All right, got to ban that person. Um, there's these really th uh, really cool things called um, tempo trainers. There you are. They're these little circular things. They're about this big, and you can tuck them into your cap. And that'll actually, um, it'll make a bunch of beeps in quick succession and you can actually uh, change the frequency of the beep or that means how long um, in between the beeps. And you can use that to, I mean, they're super annoying to use, but they're super effective at the same time because all you hear is this beeping and sometimes you'd wake up in the middle of the night uh, imagining that you hear these things. But I would, I would suggest getting some of those um, or getting one of those. They're pretty cheap and they're really, really useful. Um, do, uh, as a last question, do you have any tips for improving your rotation or making sure there's, there's the same amount of rotation on either side? Um, honestly, yeah. Uh, some coaches might not like it, but I would pull on the lane or I would focus on taking my whole body rotating and kind of getting, um, I would say like, if here's my chest. If I'm something flat on backstroke, I would rotate to where I'd have my, my sternum pointing to the lane rope and I'd grab the lane rope and pull myself through to the other side to where I'm exactly on the other side. So I do a 50 where I kind of, in a way that's over exaggerating my backstroke rotation, but I'm learning how to kind of throw my chest both sides, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, by the way, whoever keeps signing in as inappropriate names, I will find your email and I'm just going to ban you permanently. So uh, stop doing that. Um, so these are, this has been great. Honestly, you know, there's, it's a lot of fun for me to be able to just talk backstroke with somebody because um, I'm kind of a swimming nerd and I don't get to do that as much. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for taking time, you know, out of your schedule to do this with us again, Chris. I really appreciate it. And for everybody here in chat, um, if you guys have any other questions for us, I encourage you to reach out to me on Instagram or to uh, Christopher on Instagram. Christopher, what's your uh, Instagram handle? It's uh, Christopher underscore P. Reed. I'll leave it in chat too. Here, I, I just did that. And I'm going to broadcast it to the room so everybody should be able to see that. Um, but yeah. reach out to us with any any extra questions that you guys might have. You're going to get an email with a, a link to the replay of this video. Um, if you want to go on our website and look at all the other replays of our videos, uh, you can go to fitterandfaster.com slash replay. Or if you want to look at our upcoming shows, you need to go to fitterandfaster.com slash live to uh, sign up for any of your other webinars that might be interesting to you. Um, you have to sign up for each one individually. That way we don't sign you guys up. You guys aren't getting bombarded with emails for all these different ones. Also, um, pay attention to Fitter and Faster social accounts. We've got all sorts of good stuff planned for you next week already. There's also an offer up on your screen to something called Swim Videos On Demand, which is actually an app that Fitter and Faster has where you can find all sorts of really good drills with explanations from some of our clinicians. Um, definitely check that out. There's a free trial. Give it a shot. See what you think. Um, other than that, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and we will see you tomorrow for a couple more webinars. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye.